The seated row is one of the most butchered exercises, period. For example, if this, or even this, resembles your form, you're wasting your time. Because honestly, the back is one of the easiest muscles to grow. So if yours isn't, it's not your genetics, it's you. But don't worry, I'm gonna show you exactly how. On top of that, by the end of this video, I'm gonna teach you how to suck your own dick. You think I'm joking? Let's get after it. We're gonna go over some of the common mistakes that people make on lat pull downs, seated rows, deadlifts, and even high elbow rows. But let's start with the seated row because it bothers me the most. Now, if done correctly, it's a phenomenal exercise for your lats. Most people categorize it as some ultimate mid-back exercise that hits everything from rhomboids to mid-traps to rear delts. That's, that's not the case. To best target your rhomboids, you shouldn't even row the weight, you should shrug it. If you wanted to target your mid-traps based upon fiber orientation, you should do a high elbow row. And if you're trying to hit rear delts, then you should just train your damn rear delts. The reason this is such a great lat exercise is because when your arms are close to your body, it falls right in line with one of the primary functions of the lat, which is extension. The only other muscles that can help with this action are your teres major or the clavicular head of your pec, or your biceps if you really screw it up. The biggest mistake on these becomes very apparent when you look at the form that most people use when they do these. Most people opt for a very rigid back, straight up and down spine, which makes sense. Their heart's in the right place because they don't wanna injure their back and shit out their spine. I understand. Your lat actually comes up and gives your humerus the old reach around before it attaches, meaning that the more your shoulder goes into abduction, the greater stretch on the lat. So you can see the issue with this exercise is that we have a very limited range of motion of that lat. You're basically letting it stretch slightly and then yanking it back up. That's the equivalent to if you're training biceps and you go to do a curl and you barely let the weight go down and you jerk it right back up. What's that gonna do? In reality, you should have just as much hatred in your heart for this exercise as you do for T-bar rows. Because the way you do this exercise correctly is basically the exact same way. Specifically, you're gonna hinge at the hips in the same way you do with the T-bar row. That's gonna create the angle you need with your back to be able to create length on that lat. And as long as your abdominals and erector muscles are tight, you can use significantly heavier weight without any issue and really overload that lat. And I know that's not significantly heavier, but I just did this a second ago and I, I almost died. Another fatal mistake that people make has to do with three words you're gonna hear me say throughout this video because it is the key to all back training, which is depression, protraction, and retraction. Your scaps are the key to make sure the tension stays in the muscle you're trying to target. For example, if you don't engage your lower traps and your straightest anterior to depress your scapula as you row, over time it's gonna elevate, which is gonna shift the tension into your upper traps. And we've all seen people like this. When they row, they try not to, but they go directly into their upper traps and you just assume that they probably masturbated themselves into this predicament. And the reason it's so important to think about the eccentric part of the movement as actively protracting your scap is because what's happening is that scapula is actually moving along your rib cage and creating additional length in that lat. Because if you're not conscious of what's happening to your scaps as you go into the negative, you can actually create an incredibly deep stretch but have zero tension on the lat. Yeah, it's at length, but at this point, all the tension is in your trap and in your neck, and if that's the case, then what's the point of even doing the exercise if you skip over eccentrically loading the lat in the first place? What I want you to do instead is depress your scap, and then instead of letting the weight pull you into the negative, I want you to focus on punching through your serratus anterior because as long as that's engaged, you're gonna maintain tension on that lat. And then it's obviously important to force those shoulder blades into retraction because if you don't, you can't fully contract your lat. And we've all seen people like this, this is where the phrase monkey fucking a football came from. Now there obviously are some advanced techniques where you'd want to train a muscle at length the entire time, but you're not, you're not there yet. So to summarize the perfect seated row, you're gonna hinge at the hips. That's gonna give you the angle you need to fully stretch those lats. But before you do, you depress those scaps and as you punch forward, you punch through your serratus anterior, fully stretching. And as you come back, retract those scaps. And I guarantee if you do it like this, you're eventually gonna be less small. Side note, I'm a big fan of nose strips. I wear them to bed, I wear them when I work out, and my favorite ones are these black ones by Hostage Tape, but I have a big ass oily nose, so I told them they don't stick as well as they should. But, they sent me these. And does that not look like my ugly face? These are supposed to be stickier, so we'll see. 
Better. The reason I said the back has some of the easiest muscles to grow is because I'm assuming we all had that same ex-girlfriend who hated the gym but decided to come with us for a few weeks in a row and what do you know, her back got wider and her shirts didn't fit anymore and you never heard the end of it. Luckily for us, she slipped and fell in front of a bus and that was the end of it. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that the lat pull down is basically a cheat code. When I tested it with the EMG devices, as long as you're wide enough, your biceps are always gonna be less engaged than your lats. That, however, doesn't mean you can't screw it up because I've done it. The most important thing is to make sure those scaps don't elevate and transfer the movement into your upper traps. As long as they're depressed, you're gonna maintain the connection with your lats. As you get more advanced, then you can start protracting at the top of the movement to really force the stretch and then retracting to exaggerate the contraction. But more than anything, make sure you keep those scabs down. I know, easier said than done, but the concept's a lot easier to master when you're doing something that allows you to keep your lats close to your body, like a V-bar handle. Now, instead of only slightly protracting and retracting like you did with the wide grip, it has to be your entire focus, otherwise you're gonna pull it into your biceps. So, depress, protract forward as you stretch, retract as you come back. And this is an exercise that I didn't do for a while because when I tested it with the EMG device, I got so much bicep activation, but in reality, that's a static contraction. And a lot of that was fixed by being able to better control my scapula. So again, for the most effective wide grip lat pull downs, make sure your hands are one, wide enough so it's not into your biceps, depression. And then as you go into the stretch, force protraction, contract down, retraction. And it's just those slight little movements at the top and bottom that really exaggerate and get a little bit more out of it. Oh, I almost farted. That's close. Similarly, with the close grip, force depression, elbows stay tucked in the entire time, force protraction and retraction. Except with this one, it's a lot more exaggerated. Now, when it comes to deadlifts, the biggest mistake isn't actually with the form itself, it's with programming them. And I know I used to be the most avid deadlifter. I think they're in every single program to the point that if I left the gym on back day without doing deadlifts, I felt like I should just leave my testicles because I didn't deserve them. Here's the way I think about it. If you could only do two exercises for the rest of your life, either heavy deadlifts or heavy rows, which one would get you closer to the result you want? It's definitely heavier rows. Now, for somebody that just loves to deadlift, by all means, keep doing it. I just think you're better off programming some heavier hip hinge movement like glute base RDLs or stiff legs that also hit your erector spinae muscles. Because there's no way around it. When you have deadlifts during the week, then they're gonna mess up your leg day, and then your leg day is gonna mess up your back day, and then you're gonna constantly feel like shit. But lastly, let's talk about the high elbow row. And this could be the dumbbell version or a chest supported T-bar row. And I'm gonna spare you reiterating the same three words over and over again, but yes, that's how you should do these. But there is one mistake I want you to look out for that everybody makes, including myself, and that's creating a pivot point in their upper back to hinge over top of. Your chest should not lift off the pad. It should stay in contact the entire time and protraction and retraction. That's it. Now, I know you've been waiting for me to drop the new program. I've seen the comments. Don't worry, I heard you loud and clear. And that's why I created the most challenging program yet that I call how to tongue punch your fart box in 30 days. Now, I know what you're thinking. It's never been your goal to polish your leather Cheerio to the point it glistens like a freshly fried Krispy Kreme donut. But it comes back to one of my favorite sayings. Shoot for the moon, even if you miss, you'll fall amongst the stars. Meaning that even if you fail and you're never able to toss your own salad, at least you'll be flexible enough to deep throat that churro. And I know what you're thinking. Even if it works for other people, how do I know it's gonna work for me? Take Gabby, for instance. When I first met her, she was just an innocent woman who didn't speak a lick of English, just sitting out in front of Home Depot looking for work. Now look at her. She still can't speak a lick of English, but is that even a requirement anymore? What's important is she can lick her own ass. People always ask me, Ryan, why do you care so much? Why did you dedicate your entire life to helping others? The only thing I could say is, how do you not? After you see the look on your customers' faces after they've reached their goals, how do you not dedicate your life? I mean, look at Gabby. Look at that shitty grin. That makes it all worth it. I don't know if I pissed on myself or what. In all seriousness, what I've done is I've created an app that I'm gonna use to consistently drop new programs. The first one, is the best so far. It's a 12 week push pull legs that's got some sprinkles of high volume so you can crush yourself and then also throw up in your mouth. It's glorious. The cool part is now you can track your own weights and there's an exercise library of stuff that you know works. So if you wanted to create your own workout, 
by all means, go for it. Now to get this done, I had to set it up as a subscription, which I know, subscriptions are fucking dumb. But I set up a free seven day trial, so if you don't like it, piss off. Or if you wanna do it for just a month and then stop, I don't give a shit. But my goal is to make this app actually useful in your life, unlike every other fucking app on your phone. So not only will there always be a new program in there for you to crush yourself with, but I'm also making videos that are exclusive to the app. For example, I'm in talks right now to buy a liquid chromatograph. If you don't know what that is, that's just what they use to test the potency and quality of supplements. So imagine putting every single pre-workout or protein on the market and testing to see if what they say is in it, is actually in it. They did a study like this with melatonin and found the dose was actually anywhere from 74% to 274. That's a big difference. Or any other videos you guys wanna see. We'll vote on it. Again, there's a free trial, but honestly, you can't look me in the eyes and say you didn't spend 20 bucks last month on OnlyFans to watch a girl fart in a jar. So you can spend $20 on yourself. It's a pretty solid video though, huh?